Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to present uh, the uh, PowerPoint that Dr. Cantor has put together. And uh, I'd like to start out by explaining that Physicians for Social Responsibility was founded over 50 years ago. It's the largest physician-led organization in the country dedicated to educating about and advocating for solutions to the gravest threats to human health and survival. PSR was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 via its International Federation, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, primarily for its efforts to prevent nuclear war. In 1992, PSR expanded its scope to include climate change and other environmental threats. <clears throat> PSR has consistently opposed nuclear power because of its risk to public health and association with the proliferation of nuclear weapons. PSR has also chosen to speak out for the rights of all people to a healthy, happy, and sustainable world. These are also the goals of the post-2015 agenda. Next slide. On this special occasion, drawing attention to global health and the environment in the post-2015 agenda, coinciding with the 58th session on the Commission of the Status of Women, PSR wishes to raise again its concerns about the apparent conflict of interest between the United Nations World Health Organization responsibility to protect the public health and its close ties to the nuclear industry. Again and again, we see a pervasive pattern of secrecy, cover-up, and when inf information finally does see the light of day, minimization. There appears to be a real lack of prevention or a public health priority in policy making around nuclear energy, and in particular, the effect that this technology has on women, girls, and children. Most of the radiation protection protocols are based on the standard 18 to 30 year old man and do not take into account that women are 50% more sensitive to the same dose of radiation and young children and infants even more affected. Next slide. We know that on March 11th, 2011, the great East Japan earthquake and tsunami created a catastrophe for Northeast Japan. We soon learned that it would have global implications as the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union in 1986. Three of Fukushima's nuclear reactors melted down and through containment, allowing radioactive releases into the environment. The world finally became aware of the immense danger contained in thousands of fuel assemblies kept in the equivalent of swimming pools at each of the reactors. Although in this case, these pools are 100 feet above the ground. There is still debate as to how much radiation was released from Fukushima. But one thing is clear. This is a global contamination of wide swaths of the biosphere, creating sacrifice zones where people cannot live for hundreds or thousands of years. A study from the Max Planck Institute predicted the risk to Europe from the current number of nuclear reactors to be a catastrophic accident every 10 to 20 years, 200 times higher than the previous number. Next slide. The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, UNSCARE, published a summary report and presented these results to the UN General Assembly in October last year. This summary report contained the trend of prior UN and WHO reports, which downplayed the long-term health effects of Fukushima. The summary report concluded, in part, quote, while risk models by inference suggest increased cancer risk, cancers induced by radiation are indistinguishable at present from other cancers. Thus, a discernible increase in this population, thus a discernible increase in cancer incidence in this population that could be attributed to radiation exposure from the accident is not expected, unquote. So based on inference, not actual risk, the initial report suggested because it was hard to measure the health effects, there wouldn't be any. There was little detail about their justification, and the report was necessarily based on limited readings and partial, often tainted measurements provided by TEPCO. In addition, the crisis is clearly ongoing, 
and there was little reference to the potential of the ongoing releases to affect humans or the environment. The full report is due out next month, and although early indications are that the report will be forced to include more health effects, the presentation in Vienna last month by Malcolm Crick was substantially unchanged. The very first observation that must be taken into account was that the people of Japan were very, very lucky. You can see this illustration at the side. So we can see from this time-lapse tracking provided by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization monitoring system, over the first few weeks of maximum release, the prevailing winds were out over the ocean. The vast majority of the radioactive plume did not extend over populated areas. Although the reactors continue to leach hundreds of tons of highly radioactive water into the ocean daily, the amount of airborne releases have fallen dramatically since the early days of the event. Yet, even with these circumstances, a significant area around the, actor, the reactors has been contaminated and has been rendered uninhabitable. Despite having access to computer modeling showing significant contamination outside of the exact evacuation zone, the government initially only evacuated to three kilometers. Eventually, this was expanded to 20 kilometers, and approximately half a million people were affected and were forced to move. This did significantly reduce their potential radioactive exposure. There is currently a debate as to what level of contamination is acceptable to allow people to return to their homes. PSR wants to make clear that there is no level of exposure below which radiation is safe. And I'd like to repeat that statement. PSR wants to make clear that there is no level of exposure below which radiation is safe. All radiation poses some risk, and for each 10 millisieverts of exposure, one additional cancer is expected for each 1,000 people exposed. When large numbers of people are exposed, it may be hard to figure out which cancers are due to the radiation, but there will be additional cancers. Therefore, it is critically important to fully appreciate the health consequences being proposed to the thousands of people who will be receiving long-term exposures. Using Chernobyl, the Chernobyl accident as an additional guide, we can see that there are hot spots still requiring permanent exclusion a long way away from the plant. Fukushima continues to have a significant number of localities exceeding the cutoff used for exclusion areas in Ukraine and Belarus. Prior to the Fukushima accident, the legal limit for general population radiation exposure was one millisievert of non-medical exposure per year and for nuclear plant workers of five millisieverts per year. After the accident, when remediation efforts were unable to sufficiently reduce the exposure, the government moved to relax the standards to a sliding scale between one and 20 millisieverts. This will have important consequences. A presentation to the International Experts Meeting on Radiation Protection after the Fukushima Daiichi accident by Kimaki Saito of the Japan Atomic Energy Agency and published on the IAEA website shows that there continues to be large areas tinted chartreuse or light green which exceed five millisieverts airborne exposure per year. Additional presentations at the meeting demonstrate that nearly 60% of the contaminated land is forest where there's been little to no remediation of radioactive contamination. It is likely that similar to Chernobyl, there will be wide swaths of territory that must remain closed. The radioactive cesium becomes part of the ecosystem. It is incorporated into the trees and plants, and when these decay or are burned, they release the contamination into the environment. Next slide. What does this mean for people living around Fukushima? For the women and children in particular, we now know that it is harmful to expose pregnant women to radiation. However, this was not always true. Dr. Alice Stewart, a British physician, discovered through elegant epidemiological studies in the 1970s that a single x-ray of a fetus in utero 
was sufficient to cause an increase in leukemia. Dr. Stewart was attacked by the nuclear industry, but her work led to a dramatic change in our use of radiation with pregnant women. Now, we do not expose women and children unless absolutely necessary and only where the benefits of the procedure outweigh the potential harm it causes. Until recently, as our understanding of the risks have improved, the medical profession has repeatedly reduced allowable exposures, particularly for women and children. However, following nuclear reactor accidents and in consideration of the use of radioactive materials by terrorists, the trend has reversed. This new pragmatic approach, which allows greater exposure than was previously legal, is not based on science or health, but is a capitulation to the reality that the nuclear interest industry wants us to accept. Up to now, our species has made choices with little regard to the long-term implications for ourselves and our planet. It is essential now that the path we chart be a sustainable one. The post-2015 agenda builds upon and expo expands the successes achieved by the Millennium Development Goals. If the global community is going to agree to a plan to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals post-2015, to address the challenges of economic development, social inclusion, environmental sustainability, and good governance, then we can see that nuclear power is antithetical to those goals on several fronts. The nuclear industry is cloaked in secrecy and has repeatedly demonstrated a failure to be forthcoming about the true risks and consequences of the technology. We know that implications of accidents and miscalculations can extend for generations and affect human and non-human ecosystems on a massive scale. In particular, the effects of radiation on women and children demand special attention attention. We must protect our most vulnerable and guarantee the safety and health of our entire ecosystem. Um, In the last slide, I think it is fitting to look back at John F. Kennedy's comments upon the signing of the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty in 1963. We are not talking about inevitability. We are not talking about a natural phenomenon from which we cannot escape or which can be weighed against substantial benefits for individual patients. We are talking about a choice we are making. And I'd like to read this quote in closing. The number of children and grandchildren with cancer in their bones, with leukemia in their blood, or with poison in their lungs might seem statistically small to some in comparison with natural health hazards. But this is not a natural health hazard, and it is not a statistical issue. The loss of even one human life, or the malformation of even one baby, who may be born long after we are gone, should be of concern to all of us. Our children and our grandchildren are not merely statistics toward which we can be indifferent. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 1963. Thank you very much.